Good morning. It is time to get started. We're so glad to see you this morning. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we're excited that you've chosen to come and be part of our service this morning here at Leoma Baptist, and you're in for a treat. Um, we're excited to have Christmas time kicking off this year, and you look at me like that's crazy. It's not Christmas time. But for us, it is Christmas time because one of the ministries of our church is we do what's called our special children's Christmas party every year. And this year it's going to be on December 5th. It's the first Thursday of that, of that month. And what we do is in, in our county school system, there are 155 special needs children that are in UDL classes, which means they're, um, I'm not real sure what that means, but they're in UDL classes. But what we do is of the 155, they bust them into our church on that one day, all 155 of them with teachers and aides and fill in the blank, and there'll be about 200 plus people here that day that we get to minister to. Now, the way you get to help with that is every teacher in the system has sent a list of what that UDL ch child wants for Christmas. And so we provide that gift for them as a church, and, and that's where you come in. So this morning at the end of the service, Pastor David's going to give you a cue uh, of when we get to help with that. So here it's real simple. Here's what we're going to do. You just come to this box or this box over here behind me. And you reach in here without looking who it is. Doesn't matter who it is. And you pull out one card. It's like I've got this little boy who wants puzzles and any type of boy toys, but no small pieces. So the teacher has told us exactly what this child wants. And we're going to spend about 10 to $15 per gift. And then you bring it back to us wrapped with that card attached to it by December 1st, and on the Thursday that, um, that we have the party, Santa Claus will show up. Dale? Dale plays Santa Claus for us every year. Ho, ho, and this year we have Miss, Mrs. Claus is going to be with him. Miss Teresa is going to show up, and she's going to be Mrs. Claus. We even have Buddy the Elf that shows up. And if y'all have never seen Dustin Bowman in a pair of tights <laughs> and an elf costume... You need to mark December 5th on your calendar because that's worth the price of admission. Um, but anyway, it's a fun time for us. We have all these kids, and they're spread out all over, the, all over the church downstairs, just loving on them. And, um, you know, as you know, that we were building this building over here, and we have a ministry that's going to be designated just for special needs ministry. And so this is kind of how that got started. And so we get to do this on December 5th, and we would love at the end of the service if you'll come up and get one of these. And what we're asking you to do is I'll be on this side, and Miss Amber will be on this side, that we just get a picture of you holding that card up. That way, we don't have to come back later on and say, well, who got number, so who got William from whatever school? And so we were able to keep track of it from that way. All right? If you have any questions at the end of the service, just ask them, and it's going to be real self-explanatory, and we'll get them handed out. All right? I'm going to open this up in prayer, and then we will get to our, uh, our services. God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, the response we had in the first service, Lord, from the message as well as these, uh, these gift ideas for our, our children. Lord, I pray that you'll be with our time together this morning. Lord, that you'll be in the middle of this service, that you'll speak through Pastor David and through the worship time. And God, just come into our presence. Lord, we are so fortunate to be in a church that gets to serve and it embraces serving like we do. Um, Lord, thank you for the way you, you, you showed up last week with our autumn adventure and how we got to love on our community through that. And this is just another way that we get to do that. So I pray that you'll be in this ministry and continue to bless it. And just let the, the children and the teachers uh, feel the love that we have for them. Jeremiah, I pray. Amen. Let's rise and worship.
We needed that reminder this morning. Fear can't get in the way. Let's just worship him free, not encumbered by the world and what's going on right now. But let's be here with our brothers and sisters in Christ and let's focus on him.
looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you and this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you the god of breakthroughs on our side forever lift him i with all creation cry god we praise you Praising Him. There were walls. There were walls between us. By the cross you came and broke them down, you broke them down. There were chains around us, by your grace we are no longer bound, no longer bound. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is strong. Shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. Hear the song awaken. All creation singing. We're alive. Cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave. You call me into the light. You call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love
Your love awakens us. Your love, you do your part every time. Lord, I pray that we would look past our circumstances this morning, our fears, our doubts, and realize that our fear doesn't stand a chance when we're focusing on you because you've already won the battles. Please help us to trust you, Lord, and to stop struggling alone, but also to look left and right and see those that you've placed in our lives and lean on each other to not be divided by small things, but to be focused on the most important thing, and that's honoring you, bringing glory to your name, worshiping you until the day we're standing in heaven with you. I love you. In Jesus' name we all say it. Amen, amen. How many of you all have had that moment this week where God's love awakened you? Okay, there's four of you. I'm a little concerned. Come on, this is something that should happen every single day of every single moment of our life as a Christian is that God's love just absolutely just shatters and blows your mind and you, you just go, wow, God, you're amazing, right? I mean, it's what it should happen every day. God's amazing, incredible love. I love that song. Thank you, Rort and Ben, for leading us. Listen, let me kind of talk to you about two things before I jump into the message today. First of all, I know that this week, is a big week in the life of our country. We have this thing called the Election Day on Tuesdays. And by Tuesday night, all the ballot boxes will be closed and all the voting booths will be shut down. Um, and it's pretty soon we'll find out who our next president is going to be and who is going to be ruling in Congress and, and the House of Representatives and all those things. And I think that should be a matter of prayer for us as Christians. So one of the things that we're doing here at our church tomorrow night is Monday night. The night before the final day of voting, um, we're going to open up our church here from 6 to 7 and just pray. So if you want to come and you just want to kind of kneel down, you just want to sit in a pew, it's going to be quiet. We're not going to have a program. We're not going to have any music. Uh, we're just going to pray. We're just going to seek the Lord together as a church. And so I encourage you to come. Be here at 6 to 7 uh, tomorrow night. We're just praying. Uh, I think a lot of churches and a lot of organizations are doing that throughout the country because um, I believe that God is the one who's going to put whoever needs to be in office in office, and he's a sovereign, holy God, right? And we're going to trust in that. So let's, let's be a part of that. Um, that's tomorrow night. Um, also, in your bulletin, go ahead and get out this little insert. I'm going to walk you through this real quick. Um, we're, we're getting ready for the holidays here. Marty's already mentioned something about the special children's Christmas party we're going to do, but one of the things we enjoy doing here as a church is on Wednesday night, on Feb on, I'm sorry, Wednesday night, November the 20th, uh, we have our Thanksgiving dinner here together as a church. That's a Wednesday night. Instead of having services, we have the service downstairs in the gym. Everybody comes and brings a side dish. And we have communion together, and we kind of share what we've been thankful for. It's one of my favorite times of the year, so I encourage you to be a part of that. Um, that's on one side of your insert, and so I encourage you, if you're going to be there for that, let us know. But only one per family. Just put your family name, how many in your family is going to attend that night, and then what you're going to bring. If you're going to bring a vegetable or bread or a dessert or all three. So that'd be great. We supply the meat, and we supply the drinks and all the other stuff. We're going to have a great time together, and we have communion downstairs, so you're not going to want to miss that. We pack the gym out for that. It's all, all just a great, incredible event. So make sure you sign up for that. On the other side of the insert is what we do on Thanksgiving Day. Um, we kind of meet here, and we put together a lot of people fry and grill and bake turkeys and, and we, we feed about a thousand different plates all over our community on Thanksgiving Day, uh, a free Thanksgiving dinner. And so if you want to be a part of that, um, I encourage you to kind of sign your name up for this side as well. If you could cook, we, we supply the corn and the green beans, um, or if you could cook one, a couple of gallons of corn and green beans, that would be great. We'll supply it for you. We'll have it here in a couple of weeks. Um, if you could bring desserts or bread, if you could help in the kitchen, be here to help deliver, please put that down. You can check multiple places there on that form put your name down so we can know who all's coming and who's going to be here to help us with this this is an incredible outreach of our church that we've been doing for many many years touches a lot of lives so make sure you fill this out both sides fold it in half and then drop it in our offering bins on our way out today okay so make sure you do that so we are getting back into this sermon series that we have been in on the sermon 
on the Mount. This is one of the most incredible sermons that Jesus ever kind of just, one of the, his greatest discourses in the Bible. Um, we have been in it for several weeks. We've called this series, How to Thrive. How do we live a thriving Christian life? And we are, uh, we're just kind of walking our way through the Sermon on the Mount. And if you've got your Bible, you can turn over to Matthew chapter 7 today. Yes, we're going to talk about judging people. You're not as excited as I am, right? I was, I was kind of hoping maybe Marty or Rorick would probably preach this one or somebody. I'd give it away. But nope, we're going to talk about judging people. We're going to talk about it. We're, we need to know what the Bible says here. about Because listen, right? Come on. We all tend to judge people. Come on. We all tend to do that, right? We, we tend to look at other people. We make judgments about the decisions they've made, the lifestyles they're living. We, we make judgments whether we, come on, we all know this to be true. We all do that. Now, some of you are a little bit holier than thou. And you're sitting back, and you're kind of laid back, and you're going to say, well, Pastor Dave, I don't really need to hear this message today. I'll just excuse myself and go on home and watch a football game because I'm pretty laid back. I'm not very judgmental. Well, maybe you need to stay as well um, because I, I've, what I found in the Sermon on the Mount is that Jesus Christ has some real application to our very real lives. Amen. And so I think this will probably apply to everybody. This has been this way this whole series. This, as we kind of dove into the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave on the Mount of Beatitudes, it's just incredible. And it's interesting here in this part of the discourse in chapter 7, the first six verses, Jesus kind of has a, a, a shift, if you will, of what he's talking about. Jesus has always, up to this chapter, has been talking about things that are personal between me and God. He's been talking about, you know, finances. He's been talking about money and prayer and fasting and anxiety. But now he kind of shifts and he talks, he starts talking about our relationships with other people. This is interesting because I think God cares just as much as our, about our relationships with other people than he cares about our relationship with him. Both are very, very important. And here Jesus begins to address how we interact with other people. How many of y'all have some struggles when interacting with other people? Raise your hand. Okay, the rest of you are lying. We'll talk about lying next week. So, so these verses talk about this. And so you know in simple terms, if, if you just kind of look at verses 1 through 6, that's what we're going to cover today in chapter 7 of Matthew. It's really kind of just got one challenge, and it's got two very vivid illustrations that kind of help us understand what Jesus is really trying to say. And so the one challenge is really, if I could just kind of narrow it down to two words, judge not. How many of y'all have heard that before? Don't judge me, right? Don't judge me. The Bible says don't judge me, right? They don't know where it is in the Bible, but they just know it's there, and they kind of use it for their advantage to say don't judge me, right? How many of y'all have been part of those conversations, right? And so this is what it's there. And so we often take this out of context whenever it's advantageous to us, and we often kind of just don't understand what Jesus is really trying to say here. So let's look at chapter 7, verse 1 and verse 2. Judge not. That you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, will be measured to you. Now, maybe the question is, what is exactly, what exactly is Jesus saying here? Is he saying that if I judge somebody else, they're going to judge me in the same way I judge them? Or is Jesus saying the way I judge somebody else is the way God will judge me? And the answer is yes to both. Right? So just bear with me here. I mean, Jesus is saying, that, that, listen, you all know this to be true. How many of y'all were in third grade at one time? Y'all been to the playground in third grade? If, if you're mean to somebody in the third grade, what are they going to do back to you? They're going to be mean. We all learned that in third grade. Everybody knows that. That's common sense, right? You, you, you will reap what you sow. We all know that, right? And so uh, what goes around kind of comes around, right? That's common sense. Everybody understands that. But, and the chances are, if you're going to be hard on somebody, you're going to be critical of somebody, they're going to be hard, they're going to be critical on you, right? We all get that. We all understand that. But I think there's something more than just that here in this passage, I think Jesus is also talking about the relationship that we have with God, right? I mean, and, and here's how I know that because later on in Matthew chapter 18, there's this parable that, that Jesus tells about this unmerciful servant. It, it's a story. I don't have to, I'm not going to read it to you. I'll just tell you, tell you the story. The ruler had this servant that was indebted to him in this massive amount of money that he could never repay probably in his lifetime. And so because of the graciousness of this ruler, 
this ruler kind of said, you know what? Never mind. You don't have to pay it back. You're debt free. So he relieves this servant of his debt, right? And this, this was huge for this servant. So he walks out into the courtyard of the king and he finds somebody that, I don't know, owes him five bucks. And he starts choking him. He says, pay me back. And so when the ruler hears about this, he says, are you kidding me? I've just relieved you of a debt that you could never repay. And now you're, you know, you're struggling with somebody over five bucks. So the ruler says, I'm going to make you pay back every single penny. And I think in this parable, there's something about the fact that God, listen, God wants us to act toward others as he has acted towards us. And so he gives us this challenging command here in the first part of Matthew chapter 7. It says, do not judge or you too will be judged. And then he gives these two kind of very vivid illustrations. The first one is about a plank and a speck. And the next one is about dogs and pigs, which is kind of interesting. So let's read verse 3. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. I think it's important here to notice that in this passage of Scripture I just read, that three times Jesus used the word brother. So that means that Jesus is talking about people that we are in relationship with. These are people that we know. These are brothers and sisters in Christ. These are family members. These are people we work with, that we know, that we love. And this is how we're supposed to act toward them. And then he shifts in the very last verse of our text today, verse 6, and he's talking seemingly about maybe another group. Here's what he says in verse 6. Listen to this. This is powerful. Do not give dogs what is holy. And do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. <laughs> you read this and you think, what in the world is Jesus talking about here? Pigs and dogs? I mean, what is, I mean this kind of seems like it's kind of out of place, but I don't think it is at all, church. I think the reality is, and, and you all know this, in your life, there are people who, when you share the gospel with them, they desperately want to hear it. They need to hear it. They want to hear it. They desire to hear it. But we also know that there are other people in the world who are very antagonistic and hostile towards the things of God. Y'all been with those people before? Yeah, and so Jesus here is, is kind of giving us a warning. He's saying, look, 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 there, there's, here's how you need to, 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 to think about this with other believers, and here's how you need to think about this with people who are kind of against hearing the gospel. This is how you need to think about this. And so Jesus is giving us some incredible wisdom here. Some people have said that this dogs and pigs reference has to do with maybe talking to Gentiles. Because in other parts of the scripture, other places, uh, the people of Israel, the people that were not of the people of Israel were, were referred to in that way. I don't know if that's true or not, but all I know is this. Here's what I know about each of us here today. I know that Thanksgiving is coming, right? And you're going to be sitting around the dinner table with a lot of family members you haven't seen in a while. And inevitably, one of them is going to have that weird, that kind of weird kind of outlook on life. And when you start bringing up church, when you start bringing up religion, when you start bringing up Jesus and the Bible, they're going to go, oh, don't want to hear it. Hand to the face, right? Don't Talk to the hand, right? I don't want to hear about your Jesus stuff. Y'all have those in your family and your friends and your acquaintances? And so now what you could do is you could just kind of get them in a headlock and say, I'm going to tell you about Jesus whether you like it or not. You never know what you're going to get at Leoma. <laughs> but I'm just not sure that's going to work, folks, right? I'm just not sure that's probably going to make your uncle or aunt or cousin or brother or maybe your spouse ain't more angry at you, right? That's not going to help. And so Jesus has kind of given us some wisdom on how to do this. Now, what we do sometimes if we have somebody like this in our life where maybe they're kind of antagonistic against the gospel, Hostile, maybe. What do we do? Well, Jesus is saying, look, we, we need to maybe create some distance here. Now, bear with me here. This is what Jesus says. He, he says, we need to distance ourselves. In other words, don't, don't, just, don't just throw something that's holy to the dogs. Right? Don't, don't just take off your pretty pearls and throw them to the swine, the pigs, Right? 
They'll just trample all over that. And so here's what we should do. Jesus is saying, Lee, you need to live your life in such a way that when that person that's antagonistic, when that person that's hostile toward the gospel finally comes to a point where maybe, maybe they're ready to hear a little bit about Jesus, they'll, they'll go to you to ask the question. Because you're living your life in such a way that they see Jesus in you, right? And so when they see enough of joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness, they'll say, you know what? That's somebody that kind of looks like this God that I'm thinking about. I'm going to ask them about God. Amen? That's what Jesus is saying here. And so when you get that opportunity then, once you live your life in a way that people kind of see Jesus in you, then you're able to give them something holy. You're able to give them the pearl of the gospel, right? And so, and they're ready to hear it. And so church, this is how we're supposed to respond to people who are outside that are hostile. We have distance, but yet we live a life that's attractive to the world. So let's be really clear here with this passage. Don't hear me wrong. Jesus is not saying here, just don't evangelize. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not saying everybody that's not in the family of God is a hostile. Beware. That's not what Jesus is saying either. There's a lot of people, folks, that need to hear the gospel. And they're in your families. And they're in your neighborhoods. And you work with them. They're, they're, they're in your school systems. They need to hear the gospel. And maybe they're just waiting for you to kind of invite them to church, to start a spiritual conversation. Maybe that's what they need. And they're ready to hear that. And we understand that there's some people that aren't ready for that. And Jesus has given us some wisdom here to how to navigate that correctly. All right? So the rest of our time together today, we're going to talk about the kind of the place and kind of the posture and the order by which we can make judgments, you heard me right, about other people. Amen? You parents in the room, you make judgments about your kids every single day. Why are you wearing that? Where are you going? What are you doing? Right? I mean, you're, you're, you're doing that all the time because you're a good parent. And, and, and God, God, Jesus is not saying we can't be judge, judging. Jesus has given us a way to do it appropriately. Now, now, how many of y'all know this to be true? We judge ourselves by our intentions, right? We judge others by our actions, right? Hey, husbands in the room, how many times have your wife kind of said, hey, could you empty the kitchen trash? Yeah, baby, I'll be in a minute. I love you, baby, I'll do it. And then and you get kind of caught up in that last, you know, quarter of the football game, and you kind of tend to forget about it, and then maybe, I don't know, an hour, three days go by, right? And you haven't emptied the kitchen trash, and you love your wife, and, and your, intention, your intentions were really, really good, but what is she doing? She's judging you on your actions or the lack thereof, right? And we all know this to be true. We do this all the time. We do this in the way we treat one another. We have good intentions, but ultimately the world's going to judge us by our actions. So how do we navigate all that? We're pretty easy on ourselves. Right? But church, listen to me. We are hard on everybody else. So let's make something crystal clear about this passage. Jesus is not saying, don't judge, don't be discerning. Jesus is not saying, don't hold anybody accountable. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not saying, hey, just, you know, everything's going to be okay. Just don't really kind of get into anybody's business. That is not what Jesus is saying at all. In fact, the own, his own life, Jesus' own life and his own teachings are, are showing us in the scripture that we as the people of God are meant to be careful we are, we are meant to be cautiously discerning with other people. The people of God are meant to be intentional about relationships that we have, whether they're right or wrong. And so, in fact, I'll just kind of give you a clue. Just a little bit farther down in this chapter, in chapter 7, Jesus is going to talk about a tree and its fruit. And he says, he says you, you can tell a tree by the fruit it produces. Right? A, a good tree is going to produce what? Good fruit. A bad tree is going to produce what? Bad fruit. We all understand that. And so clearly that means that we're supposed to, as Christians, look and determine in other people's lives whether that life is good or bad. Right? Well, again, we do this all the time as parents. Whether, whether this is a relationship that I need to step into or whether maybe this is a relationship I need to back away from. 
This is what Jesus is teaching us here. And so what I think he's doing here, and I love this, Jesus is drawing a distinction about the posture of our heart. This is a heart issue, church. And our heart has to be in the right place to approach judging somebody or discerning something. No, you know, listen, and, and here's how we do it. We've got three ways that are wrong, by the way, of how we do this. Some of you in the room, that's, that's some, you'll relate to one of these three. Uh, one way is to do it really quickly, right? I mean, one way is that I see the situation. I know what's happening here. Um, I, I'm done with this. I'm, I, some of you are just quick judgers. How many of y'all are quick judges? Don't raise your hand. Don't, don't admit that. I mean, we're just quick judges. We, we do it. We, we say, I know exactly what's going on here. This is wrong. I'm, I'm a judging, right? We just kind of jump on the judge, judgment bandwagon, right? That's what we do. And so well, and what we do in that process, or, or what we do is we just are all caught up in right or wrong. And we say, I am right and you are wrong, therefore you are wrong. And that's the end of the discussion, Right? And we're all caught up in right or wrong. Or, here's the worst one. What we do is we see somebody that does something wrong. And we place a moral critique on that person because of the behavior that they've done. And we say like this. We say, they did something bad, therefore that person is bad. And that's what we do. And so Jesus, folks, listen, listen. Jesus is saying, these are the postures that I'm warning you about. Got really quiet in here because we're all guilty of those. We're quick judges, right or wrong. You know, we start placing moral critiques on people because of their bad behavior. And Jesus is saying, No, 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 I'm warning you. He's saying, Don't be quick in your judgments. It's not always about right and wrong, it's not about moral critiquing somebody because of the behavior that they did. He invites us, church. He's done this all throughout the Sermon on the Mount, but He's inviting us to do something different. He's saying, let's go a little slower. Let, let's maybe, maybe we need to say, you know what? Maybe I don't have all the facts on this situation. Maybe I need to pray a little bit more. Maybe I need to have a few more conversations before I make a judgment because maybe I'm not seeing clearly. How many of y'all have ever been blinded and not see clearly, right? It's based on wise discernment. It's, it's based on kind of praying, saying, Father, help me see this through your eyes. Holy Spirit, help me understand what's going on in this situation. I read this in a commentary as I was studying this week. It just blew my mind. Listen to this sentence. I'm going to leave it on screen. As followers of Jesus, we cannot hate any person on account of the sins they may commit. But neither can we approve of any sin on account of a person that we may love. I want you to look at that for just a minute. Just kind of feast your eyes on that because if you think about that, I think we've got a lot of that backwards. Yes, Christians, in the church, we have a lot of this backwards. How many of us, come on, if we're really honest, we hate people that we don't even know. Come on. Because you saw what they posted on social media. You saw what they did on the news. And I hate them. That's what we do. Come on. We're, we're, all, we're all going, oh, we're gu guilty. Yeah, gu I mean, we're all guilty. And with this world of, of social media, man, we are just so quick to kind of hear people's words and see their actions. And all of a sudden, we have instantly made a judgment and we absolutely hate them. And church, can I just say this to you? Listen to me carefully. Jesus is saying you can't hate somebody on account of their sin. By the way, if Jesus would have hated us for our sins, he would have never died for us. Right? And so, and sometimes we do the opposite of this, the other side of this, which I think is maybe even a little scarier. Sometimes we, because of the people we love, we tend to overlook or even approve of sin because it's happening with someone that we love. Someone that we, someone that we know really well. And I mean, I think at the very least we do this to ourselves, Right? Yeah, I mean, come on, I, I'm justifying my sin because I, I know who I am. I know uh, you know, what kind of person I am. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with this. We do that. We overlook a lot of sin because we're in relationship with the one who is sinning. And sometimes that one who's sinning is ourself. So Jesus, by the way, in the Sermon on the Mount, has already kind of discussed both of these issues in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, remember what he said earlier? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In other words, church, you can't hate people because of their sin, Jesus is saying. 
But he also says, he, he says you can't take sin lightly. Remember what he said? If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Jesus did not come to abolish any of what's right and wrong in the law, but to fulfill it. And so we can't turn away from sin either. So now let me just kind of say, I know for a lot of you, maybe this is difficult. This is hard. Because some of you have a child, you have a brother, you have a sister, you have maybe a spouse, a dear friend that's wandered away from God. They're living a lifestyle or they're, ta- they're making choices against God's word and you love them. You love them, but you're wondering, how do I love them without affirming their sin? Been there? How do I have a conversation in a way that's fruitful? And I think that's difficult, and this is why Jesus wants us to see clearly. And seeing clearly is kind of a theme all the way throughout the Sermon on the Mount. I want, I want you to see this clearly, Jesus is saying. There's been a lot, I mean... <laughs> the Sermon on the Mount <laughs> actually talks a lot about the eye, right? I mean, he, he says, you know, uh, there are things in secret that only God sees. Jesus says that he talks about, you know, if your eyes cause you to sin, pluck it out. Jesus says the lie, the eye is like a lamp into your body. So if you have a good eye, you have a good body. If you have a dark eye or a bad eye, you have darkness inside of you. Church, seeing things clearly really, really matters. And he's talking about it again here. And I want to suggest to you this. If you can't see clearly, church, you can't live well. Right? You, you, you can't thrive if you can't see well. You cannot do the things you're supposed to do in life if you can't see. And I think so many of us are clouded. So many of us are clouded with what the world kind of talks about with judgment. We're blinded to see the way God truly sees ourselves and others. And, and so what happens is it leads to us being judgmental. And it leads to us being, you know, mean, <laughs> We make mistakes and we cause pain between family and friends and we find ourselves in this spot kind of evaluating, critiquing people all the time and it's not working. And Jesus knew that. And I'm just wondering kind of, you know, why do we do that as Christians? I mean, I'm talking to the church. I'm talking to mostly Christians in here. Why do we do that? Why? I, I think there's several reasons. Here, here's where that comes from. The first one is I think there's a few ways we kind of get clouded. And our, and our judgment of others. I think one of them is insecurity. Y'all ever been insecure? <laughs> yeah, and so what insecurity does is we all have our little, own little insecurities. And so when we see somebody else who's doing something that we think maybe we ought to do, or we see somebody else doing something that we maybe think we, we should have been there doing that, then, well, then we get all insecure and we say, well, you know, that's great, but did you hear what decision they made earlier? Did you see what they did? And we get into, that's what we do. And so, did you know that they made this decision? Did you know they got in trouble for that? Or It's easy to go there because we don't want to look at the good they're doing because of what we're doing. Maybe you struggle with that. Maybe you struggle with insecurity. I think another reason we do this is, is just straight up pride. Right? We, all, we all are guilty of struggling with pride. We're just prideful people sometimes. And sometimes that's, we're tempted to, 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 to look at other people and say, well, they're in that reason because they made those stupid decisions. I didn't make those stupid decisions. They did. It's prideful. Right? And you look at people and you say, well, their marriage would be better if it had a marriage like mine. They wouldn't be poor if they just worked harder like I do. That's what we do. That's pride. And so, I mean, that's what you're dealing with today. A third one is, I think a lot of us have a strong sense of justice. And so we don't want to see bad people get away with the bad things that they're doing, right? Y'all been there? And so what we do then in the fact, in fact, it's, it's funny, that's how God's kind of wired us in, in the book of Psalms. <laughs> you know, David, I mean, how many times does he say, God, I want you to strike my enemies in the teeth and break their bones. I mean, he, he's looking for justice, right? But the danger is, and I think that's what God wants. God wants just, but I think the danger is when we look at other people and say, I hope they get what they deserve. Jesus is saying, be careful with that. You didn't get what you deserved. Amen? You got to be careful. God was gracious to you, and 
So the, the least of, at least God is saying here, he wants us to view others the best the way that we can with compassion and mercy, which is exactly how he has looked upon us. And so Jesus began the Sermon on the Mount. If you remember, uh, blessed are those who are merciful. They will receive mercy. So, so <laughs> there's a balance here. There's an order, there's a posture, there's a, there's a place, there's a position here of how we are to discern others. And if I could just sum up these six verses into one little statement, here's how I would say it. Humble self-examination helps me see clearly so I can help others or not. I'll get back to that statement in a minute, but I just want to kind of illustrate it. So, so Marty, can you come up here? Nathan, can you come up here? I've, I've got, give Nathan and Marty a big round of applause. They're going to help me out a little bit. Um, Marty, I want you to stand like right over here. This will be, be a visible I illustration for you guys to understand. Uh, Marty's going to stand over here. Nathan, I want you to stand over here. Nathan's wearing black. I should have had him be over there, but that's okay. Um, so, so here's what's going to happen. Nathan... He's such a good guy. So he's going to represent Jesus, right? He's going to represent everything that's holy and righteous, right? So I want you to kind of turn and face Marty, okay? So this is, this is Jesus. This is holy, righteous Jesus, okay? And then Marty, I love Marty. He's a great student pastor. He's a good friend of mine. But today, he's going to represent evil, okay? Today, he's going to represent everything evil and bad that people do, okay? I love you, buddy. Thank you for being able to do this. So, so here, and I, I'm going to represent each of you, okay? You with me? Jesus, bad us here so here's what we do here's what we do we stand over here and we just kind of lock arms with Jesus look at that look at look at Marty over there can you believe him he could you see how evil he is I mean Jesus are you kidding me with Marty really I mean we listened to the same sermon he heard it I heard it he just didn't do it I did it I did it Jesus yeah that's what we do right we all do that and, and here's the problem with that there's several problems with that first of all on the spectrum of holiness and righteousness with Jesus kind of being, you know, holy and righteous and then down here is not holy and righteous at all, where are we on the scale? We're right here, right? The Bible says we've all sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. We're all, we're all sinners. That's problem number one. Problem number two i got to go over here. i got to get my prop. Problem number two is we're looking at everybody else's speck when we've got a log in our eyes. We've got a log. And I'm over here trying to go, whoop, whoop. I'm over here trying to go, I, I'm going to get the speck out of your eye. I'm going to try to, I'm trying, I, and I can't even do it because I've got a log in mine. I'm not as great as I think I am. And you're not either. Amen? That's problem number two. Problem number three <laughs> Problem number three is when I'm over here, you know, huddling up and, you know, homing with Jesus over here, looking at evil over there. I love you, Marty. My eyes are in the wrong place. Right? In no place in this scenario should my eyes be on evil. Right? I, I should really, knowing that I'm really inevitably over here with evil... Because I'm, I'm a sinner, right, too. This is what Marty and I should be doing. We should be kind of locking arms together, kind of with our eyes fixed on Jesus, going, hey, Marty, you know what? I, I understand you've got some issues. Man, I've got them too, dude. And maybe I can help you. Maybe you can help me. Let's just continue to kind of walk closer to Jesus. Let's keep our eyes on him. Let's not keep our eyes on each other. Let's keep our eyes on him. That's the way it should be, church. We've got to change our place, our position, our posture, and our order of doing things. Amen? Let's give these guys a big round of applause. Thank you. And Jesus gives us this order. He gives it to us right here in the scripture. Look at verse 5. You hypocrite. <laughs> first, he says, there's his order. First, get the plank out of your own eye. Okay, <sighs> All right, I got it out of my own eye, right? First get the plank out of your own eye, then, 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 what does it say? You can help somebody else, right? So I want to kind of amend my earlier statement here. I've amended it. Humble self-examination first helps me clearly, see clearly so I can finally help others or not. Now some of you are struggling with that or not part, right? Some of you are going, why would you put that in there, Pastor? Why, why the or not? Well, listen. That's the wisdom. 
That's the wisdom that Jesus is trying to get us to have. It takes wisdom. It takes godly wisdom to navigate these situations in our relationships and in our lives. The wisdom from Jesus allows us to either A, step into a situation we need to step into, or maybe step out of it. Right? That's what it does. And so listen, sometimes, can I just say sometimes we need to overlook an offense. Sometimes, you know, we need to just say in our minds, you know, that offends me, but you know what? I'm just going to show you grace this time. I'm not going to go there. That would help so many marriages today if we just did that. But, but that this wisdom, sometimes this wisdom also helps us step up and say something when something needs to be said. Sometimes you need to speak up and say, you know what, dude? I am worried about you. I'm concerned. I've been watching you. And I'm concerned about you. And in love, sometimes we need to speak up. And sometimes, sometimes this wisdom shows us where we could actually maybe even help somebody. You know, we could go to somebody and say, you know what? I've watched you and I've kind of seen the path you're on. I've been on that same path. And let me tell you where it did to me. I've been there and I've done that and I bought that t-shirt. Let me help you through this. Right? And you could help somebody. Or, that's what wisdom does. Or, lastly, sometimes wisdom makes us go, you know what? I'm going to step back a little bit. I'm, going to st- I- I- I'm too involved in this situation. I'm going to step out a little bit. And I'm just going to live a righteous life in front of my person that I love and I care for. But the more I talk about it and the more I egg him on and the more I challenge, the worse it's getting. And, and that's wisdom that comes from the Lord. That's the wisdom that Jesus Christ is talking about here in Matthew chapter 7. It reminds me of a story in Luke chapter 7. You don't have to turn there. I'll just kind of tell you the story. This is, this is meaningful to me because I think it relates to our text today. It's the story of, of Jesus being at the dinner party of Simon the Pharisee. Remember that story? That Jesus comes in. It's a big dinner party. Jesus has come in, and he's kind of reclining at the table. He's eating, and all the big you know, hobnobs are around. All the big people, the rich people are there at this party. And this woman comes into the party. This woman that has a bad reputation. This woman that all the townspeople know, she doesn't need to be in this party. Where is her invitation? She's not supposed to be here. And she comes and she sits at the feet of Jesus. And she could could not stop holding Jesus' feet. She she wept on Jesus' feet. She anointed Jesus' feet. And everybody's watching this. And everybody's going, oh, I can't believe this is happening at this party. Who invited her? She's not supposed to be here. She's one of them. And Jesus, in his wisdom, sees what's happening. And stands up and he basically says, look, I, I want to tell everybody here something. I came into this party and nobody treated me any different. Nobody patted me on the back. Nobody shook my hand. Nobody greeted me. But yet this woman comes in and she can't stop holding my feet. She can't stop weeping. She can't stop anointing my feet. And he says this. He says, Her sins are forgiven because of her great love. And then then Jesus says something that just really rattles me, and this is really where I want this story to tie in. He says it this way. He says, for those who have been forgiven little, love little. So as Warwick and Avery come, this passage here, brings me into a very clear, unclouded view of how much I am in need of God's forgiveness and grace and mercy. And you are too. And by seeing this clearly helps me see other people. Seeing that clearly helps me know that God is who he really is. And we have been, listen, we have been forgiven much. Amen? That's all of us. We have been forgiven much. Not not just those people whose lives are shipwrecked. We've all been forgiven much. We deserved death. And by God's grace, we've been giving eternal life. And the only way we're going to be able to see anyone else clearly is to understand that with him. The only way we're going to be able to judge and discern accurately is to follow the wisdom that Jesus gives us in the scripture today in Matthew chapter 7. So here's what I want to do just in these next few minutes. 
I just want everybody just to kind of bow their heads and maybe just close their eyes and just get into a moment within yourself. I want us to do some humble self-examination. Maybe you need to ask yourself, what is that plank in my eye that needs to first be removed? What's the area of sin that maybe we're holding, we're wearing like a chain around our neck that needs to be removed? What's that relationship that you know about in your life that probably needs to be mended, needs to be reconciled? Maybe you need to go and apologize. So I just want you to take a moment and reflect maybe what Jesus is asking you to do. I think probably all over the room we have situations where Jesus is saying, you know what, in this situation, here's what I'm encouraging you to do. So would you just reflect on that for just a minute? Just, we're not going to stand. We're not going to go anywhere. We're just going to sit with our eyes closed. And we're just going to reflect on that as, as we sing this beautiful song called Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. Maybe that's the, that's the prayer that you need to pray. God, open my eyes so that I can see more clearly today. Let me see behind, beyond my pride, my injustice, my insecurities. God, I want to see you clearly. I, I want to see these situations in my life that I'm struggling with. How am I supposed to navigate these? How am I supposed to be discerning without being overwhelming? How am I supposed to love my person that I love and not overlook their sin? So just, just in a few moments, just, just as we sing, just, just reflect on that. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. And I to see, see you high and lifted, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy. church as you've been reflecting maybe there's some action that you need to take you can look at me maybe your intentions are good but maybe it's time to take some action and so maybe as you were reflecting maybe some of you in the room maybe kind of realized that my life is not right with God my relationship with God is not where it needs to be and maybe Maybe what you need to do this morning is just make that right. Maybe that looks like maybe you're rededicating your life to Christ. Maybe, maybe that's just you need to be saved. Maybe for the first time it's clicked and maybe you just need to surrender your life to Jesus Christ and just live your life for Him and live in that joy, live in that peace that comes only from Him. So in just a few minutes, some of our pastors will be up here. Some of our staff will be up here. We'd be glad to pray with you. If you want to make that next step in your spiritual journey, you want to be saved, you want to be baptized, you want to join the church. We had a whole family join the church this morning at the 8 o'clock service. It was awesome. But really, I'm going to ask the Christians a question here because maybe there's some Christians here that, as you've heard this message from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, maybe you're realizing you're a little bit too judgmental in some areas of your life. Maybe you're too quick to judge. Maybe you're just kind of all caught up in right and wrong. And maybe you're putting moral critiques on people because of their behavior and you don't even know them. You don't have all the facts. Maybe there's somebody here that you need to pray for because you're struggling in a relationship. Maybe it's in your family. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's at school. But I believe maybe like the first service had, maybe we Christians all over the room are just coming to the altar saying, God, help me to kind of have this discernment that you talk about. 
in Matthew chapter 7. God, I don't want to throw my holiness and my pearls of the gospel to the swine and to the dogs. God, I want to have wisdom. I want to know when to speak up and when to shut up. God, I want to know when to step into a situation, when to step out. God, give me that wisdom in that situation. Every one of you here today have that situation in your life right now. So maybe now is the time to take action. Maybe now is the time to, because you know what? I'm going to step into this with you, Lord. So let's stand. God, right now, as we sing this song, as we sing this beautiful song that just asks, God, for you to open the eyes of our heart, Lord, will you do that right now in the minds and lives of people here at Leoma Baptist Church, right now, right here. God, if there's somebody that needs to be saved, God, work in them and through them. Help them to step out of their comfort zone and go tell somebody about that. God, will you work and move right now as we sing? And I pray this in your name. Amen. Hey, y'all. My name is Rorick. I'm part of the team here at Leoma Baptist Church. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you are blessed and encouraged by the message and the music today. If you have any questions or need any info, please don't hesitate to check out our website or our Facebook page. From all of us at LBC, have a blessed week, and we hope that you'll join us again.